Father, bless us now as we minister the word of the Lord. May we do no damage but preach that which becometh sound doctrine and gospel in Jesus' name. Amen. I want to begin this message <clears throat> with a passage of scripture that the Lord gave me that kind of lays the foundation uh, to everything that I want to share with you today as I preach the word of the Lord. The Bible says in uh, St. John chapter number 8 and verse 31 well 31 and 32 then, see, then said Jesus to those Jews which believed on him if you continue in my word then are you my disciples indeed you, he says, if you continue in my word, you will really be my disciples. You think that you are my disciples. Now, nah, just continue in my word and you will really be my disciples. You will be my disciples for real if you continue in my word. You know, I could preach that for the rest of the day. It didn't say if you can continue in your imagination. If you didn't say if you continue making up your rules to serve the Lord the way you want to as you go. He says, no, you got to continue in my word. Right? Then he said this, and you shall know the truth. And the truth shall make you free. The truth shall give you independence. It frees us. The truth frees us from the ravishes of ignorance. Truth frees us from error, from sin, from law, from superstitions. It gives us freedom not to do anything we want because that's not freedom. True freedom from Christ's perspective is freedom to walk in the light of God's word. It's freedom to be the man or the woman that God made you to be. That's freedom. Well, is it freedom to get drunk or not? No, for to be drunken is not to be free. The drinker isn't free. The drinker, the drunk is in bondage to alcohol. Amen. The, the liar is in bondage to lying. The midnight rambler is in bondage to midnight rambling. The adulterer is in bondage to adultery. The fornicator, the homosexual, the liar. You're in bondage. Mm -hmm. Jesus says, I want to free you from all of that. I want to free you from depression. I want to free you from error. I want to free you from these things so that you're free to walk in the light, to be who I made you to be. I had an image of you in my mind when I allowed you to come into this earth. You were born with a preset course. True happiness is finding it. True satisfaction in life is finding what God put you here to do and then doing that with all of your might. And, and then when things come up that threatens your ability to do that, thwart those things. Get them out of your life and stay on that course. You'll live a good life. Amen. You'll live a good life. Uh, whether your life is long or short, it will be good. Praise the Lord. Holiness doesn't guarantee necessarily long life for many believers have gone home to be with the Lord at an early age, but it does guarantee a quality of life. It, it, it guarantees purpose of life. Praise the Lord. And, uh, and joy, joy, joy. 
So Jesus says, yeah, you, you will know the truth and the truth would make you free. There's so many people today who are just simply not free. They're bound. They're bound to superstition. They're bound to hatred. They're bound to racism. They're bound to um, fighting battles that are not there. The Bible teaches that, that the wicked are paranoid. The Bible says the wicked fleeth when no man pursueth. It is not the will of God for the believer to live like that. It's the will of God for the believer to be free. Amen. Free to be the man that God made you. Could you imagine uh, a bondage in your life so that you are actually arguing with, with, with your maker and you're seriously considering um, mutilating your own body because of a voice in your head? Oh, no, you need Jesus. You need Jesus to set you free so you won't have to contend with that kind of thing gnawing at you. God has given you everything in life that you could want. You have a loving wife and a loving family. God's given you a career. He's blessed you with things, but you're not satisfied. Now you're bound by the spirit of covetousness. I heard someone say the other day uh, that no one in this life gets 100% of everything they want. So sometimes in life, you, you, uh, get eight, you're doing good if you get 85% of it, but some people can't let uh, that 15% uh, uh, go, and they lose 85% chasing 15 Ecclesiastes teaches that every man needs to learn his portion. Can't nobody have it all. Oprah said one time, you could have it all. She can't get a husband. Apparently, you can't have it all. Seriously, seriously. You got your worth billions of dollars, but you can't get married. You can't have it all. God knows how. God knows how to show you up. Amen. You can have what you can have, but can't nobody have it all. And no one, no one individual represents it all. It all. And if you think, well, I see everything I need in that person, that's an illusion. Trick of Satan. All humans lack some things. Notice I didn't say all humans like something. Humans like lack things. No human being is without flaw. Our text is an interesting one. Verse, uh, chapter 5, verse 1 says, And they came over, un and they came over unto the other side of the sea, into the country of the Gadareans. Our text speaks of Jesus leaving Capernaum and sailing across the sea. The particular sea was the Sea of Galilee. And he's, he's going to a, a, uh, into the, a land, a place called Gadara. Um, country of Gadara. Now, what is interesting about this, and bear with me as I lay this much needed foundation, is that Jesus, we're going, I'm going to show you where he leaves Galilee. I think it's a little cool in here, brother. I see some of the mothers, amen, pulling their shawls a little tight. So we don't want to freeze them. To keep some teenager comfortable. Say amen. I know y'all love me. <laughs> I love you too. Our text records the, the, the closing of a very, very long day. Um, Jesus is, is going to leave the territory of the Jews and go into Gentile territory. 
Let's go into chapter 4 and, and see exactly what's going on. Mark says in verse 35 of chapter 4, And the same day when the evening was come, the same day, same day as what? Same day covers the events uh, written about in this chapter from verse 1 to verse 34. Jesus had preached all day long. It was, this was a long day. The Bible says when the evening was come. So Mark tells us two things. Same day, and we, we now know what time of day it was. It was evening. Uh, beyond the afternoon, 6, 6 p.m. and down. It's in the evening of the day. After preaching all day, you would think that Jesus would be ready to retire for today. Jesus says after preaching all day, he says, let us pass over to the other side. That goes to show some of us uh, couldn't have worked for Jesus. Jesus worked long hours. He'd been preaching all day. And instead of saying, let's take a break and we'll start up tomorrow, he gives them a tremendous assignment he says, let's uh, cross over to the other side. Now, I want you to uh, put the first slide up, Brother Dooley. I want them to see uh, this. Now, you see, you see the Sea of Galilee right here. Jesus is in this area right here. I'll show you this in the next slide in just a moment. This is where he was, Capernaum. This is Galilee. You're going to see in just a moment that Gadara is in this southeast location. The Sea of Galilee is here. And just a note for you, this is Mount Hermon. It's going to come into play in our text. Mount Hermon stands uh, 9,000 feet above sea level. The Sea of Galilee is 700 feet below sea level. There are highlands all around the Sea of Galilee, 9,000 feet above sea level, 700 feet below sea level. Christ has preached and ministered here all day. Slide number two, please. And he's about to leave Capernaum and sail over to the other side of the Sea of Galilee on his way to Gadara. This is where he's headed. Which after preaching all day up here, you would think that he spend the night. That's quite a ways to sail, whether he sails across here and has to walk down or sail across this way and has to walk down. And it's quite a walk. These are highlands uh, right here. You've got to climb these hills and go through this hilly, mountainous, rocky area to get to Gadara. And this is what our Lord says in the evening. That's been a long day, don't you think? So, and, and the Bible says in verse 36 of chapter 4, are you praying for me? It says, and when he had sent away the multitude, they took him even as he was in the ship. Now, he was already in, uh, in a ship, according to uh, verse 1 of our text of this same chapter. Chapter 4, he says, and he began again to teach by the seaside. And there was gathered unto him a great multitude so that he entered into a ship. You see that? And sat in the sea. 
And the whole multitude was by the sea on land. So a huge crowd gathered to hear our Lord preach. To separate himself from the crowd and to elevate himself so that he could minister the word to them, he went out and stood on a ship. The ship was his pulpit. And with the mountainous, hilly area in the background, because all the highlands came up around the Sea of Galilee, which was 700 feet below sea level, down in a basin, Jesus preached, and he didn't have uh, a fancy sound system like we have now, but he knew how to project his voice and get the word out. So he's preaching all day long without, probably nobody gave him any pineapple juice. Um, he didn't have rocket. He didn't have the sound text to call on. Darius, he didn't have as good as you are, brother facing and uh, brother uh, Parker and these workers. He didn't have any of them to call on. He just had to stand there on his own strength and preach and preach he did. So he tells them, let's go over on the other side. And as soon as, uh, as soon as they were on the ship, according to verse 37, a great storm, a great storm of wind and waves beat into the ship so that it was now full. Remember, Mount Hermon stood 9,000 feet above sea level. Sea of Galilee was 700 feet below. When the wind would come off of, the cold wind off of Hermon would clash with the warm air coming up from the Sea of Galilee, the result would be sudden and violent storms. The wind rushing down from the mountaintop and the wind, the hot air coming up, and boom, there they were. So the geographical location of the Sea of Galilee made it susceptible to violent and sudden storms. But at night and early morning, the sea were, were more calm. So it's evening. They're going into the nighttime, Jesus would have had a much easier trip, perhaps, had he waited till morning, but he says, let's sail tonight. And surely as they got out there on the water, the storm came up. And this storm was quite violent because Mark tells us in the last clause of verse 37, so that it was now full. That is, the ship was swamped with water. Can you imagine the disciples out there struggling, trying to stay afloat? Those waves tossing that ship nine, uh, 10, 20 feet, two, three stories high, dropping it down real low, only to toss it up again. The lightning flashing, the wind is driving. And with all this going on, we find Jesus in verse 38 and says, and he was in the hinder part of the ship asleep. On a pillow. <laughs> Our Lord sleeping through the whole thing. What he was doing was he was obeying Psalms 3 and 5 and obeying Psalms 4 and 8. Psalms 3 and 5 says, I laid me down and sleep and slept, excuse me. I awakened for the Lord sustained me. Psalm 4 and 8 says, I will both lay me down in peace and sleep, for thou, Lord, only makest me to dwell in safety. I want to say to you, saints, go to sleep. Go to sleep. Trust God. Our sustainer is the Lord. And if Jesus don't fix it, nobody can. Most certainly your staying up all night worrying won't. Some, some of us, you know, we treat worry like it has the power of faith. 
Worrying doesn't attract God's power. You're not going to worry God into moving for you. God, I'm just so worried I can't sleep. God, maybe if God see how worried I am, uh, God will bless me. Well, no, 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 no. The Lord is waiting for you to stop worrying and start believing him. You know you honor God when you give it all to him and say, well, now, Lord, I'm going to sleep. And we see where Jesus had faith in the Father. He was asleep on a pillow, and then the disciples uh, responded to the storm, more specifically to our Lord sleeping during the storm in a totally inappropriate way. What, a, what an inappropriate response. They awaken him and say unto him, Master, carest thou not that we perish? What a question. There's a statement in that question. They're accusing him of not looking out for them. You know what? Before they, before they woke him up, I would venture to say that by the time they decided to wake him up, they had told him off. He's the one who said this evening, let's go sail across this ship. We could have waited till the next day. Why did he wait? Now we're out here in all this and he's in their sleep. And we're the ones out here. We've got to deal with all of this. He put the ship out here. Peter, go wake him up. Y'all go knock on the door. Wake him. He needs to be uh, uh, awakened. And they woke him up and said something totally inappropriate. Don't you care? Do you not care that we're about to drown? And Jesus arose, according to verse 39, and he gave two stiff rebukes. So we love to cover that he rebuked the wind. But the wind ain't the only one who got it that day. He rebuked the wind and his disciples. Both, because both of them needed it. At least the wind was operating according to nature. But the disciples was operating according to faithlessness the Bible says uh, he arose and rebuked the wind and said to the sea now notice he did not rebuke the devil for the devil didn't do this Mount Hermon and those winds that blow from there met with the warm air cold air and warm air it was nature came together and it probably happened just about every night uh, on the Sea of Galilee. And so Jesus, what he did was he rebuked, do you see it? The wind and said to the sea. See, we serve a God who can even control global warming, cooling, and anything else. So don't get bent out of shape when you see something on television. Oh, you know, the ice caps are melted. You know, they sent some people up there one time uh, to, you know, see about that. How about this? They got froze in so bad that they had to fly up there and get them <laughs> because it wasn't, it wasn't global warming. They like to froze to death. Amen. They, back during the time when global warming was all the rage, they would have global warming conferences and global warming conferences. And you know what? Uh, uh, don't tell me God don't have a sense of humor. He would allow, praise the Lord, cold weather to ruin the conferences. Several conferences were, 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 were canceled due to inclement weather. So you know what they did? They changed it from global warming because I remember when it was global cooling. That was the first one about 20 or 30 years ago that by 2000, everybody's going to freeze to death. So much for that. So then they went to global warming and now they changed it on one that you can't miss, climate change. Everybody with a half a brain knows that the climate is always changing. So you don't, you don't, that messed the nature. So don't, 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 don't let them uh, frighten you. And I think that we ought to be good citizens. I don't believe in littering. I think we ought to be responsible. But do, am I afraid that the climate is getting ready to change and that we're getting ready to either burn up or freeze? No, Jesus is coming. Amen. 
and we're seeing the ugly effects of sin in this world. Praise the Lord. We live, in a, we live on a sin-cursed, fallen planet. And the, Paul says that the whole created universe is in mourning, waiting for the manifestation of the sons of God. And when nature mourns, nature mourns with tsunamis, tornadoes, hurricanes, earthquakes, volcanoes. And we can, we can, we can call it climate change, but I'll tell you what it is. It's the effects of sin in the world. How are you going to kill a million babies a year and the earth not mourn? How are we going to redefine marriage and the earth not mourn? How are we going to endorse uh, LBGTQ and everything else and call that which God calls an abomination, we call it good, and the earth not mourn? Preacher, what, what do you think about the catastrophe uh, in, in Florida and that uh, building collapsing? And where was God in that? You didn't ask where was God when they built the building, did you? It's just amazing how God always gets the blame. P plan take off and land correctly and... Uh, and you say, thank God, somebody will be on the plane. But God had nothing to do with it. It's, it's the pilot. All right, the plane crashed. Why did God let this happen? Now, if it's God, then it's God. But it can't, you can't be selective with it. Our heart goes out to those people who suffered a tremendous loss. And the count is growing. And even Jesus' heart went out to people who suffered natural uh, catastrophes. He said, do you remember the men of Shalom on whom the towers fell? Even Jesus was moved by natural disasters and things that happens to people. We live in a sin-cursed world. It didn't happen to them because, Jesus says, that didn't happen to them because they were sinners above other people. And Jesus said, except you repent, you shall likewise perish. It should be a reminder uh, to all of us that what we call safety and security is not necessarily the case. So let me, let, me, let me preach this. He says here, Jesus is asleep and Jesus, uh, they wake him up and he rebuked the wind. And he says to the wind in verse 39, peace be still. He says to the wind, stop blowing, be quiet. And look at what nature did. And the winds ceased and there was a great calm. The wind stopped blowing and the seas come down but he was not through rebuking and verse 40 says and he said to them to the disciples why are you so fearful I was sleeping well why are you so fearful how is it that you have no faith I'll be honest with you Jesus has been asking this question ever since the beginning of COVID. Sinners have more faith than we do. You, the NBA, you can watch the games, not the, the, the fans are in the stand. Watch ba uh, soccer, the, the fans are in there cheering them on. Uh, when the Bucks won the other night, last night, the fans, they showed them in uh, Milwaukee, all out there, praise the Lord, just cheering and hollering. Show a church service. Everybody masked up. Everybody scared. Every, all the saints still, oh my God. Now listen, I'm not, I mean, I'm not criticizing for man wearing a mask. That's not my point. But my point is, that comes a time. When, when you got to believe God, you can tell, you can tell uh, the Christian on the plane. Sinners act, acting for another drink. They keep it coming. <laughs> the saints in the corner, oh God, don't let this thing fall. No, 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 no. There comes a time when you got to believe God. You got to have some faith. Jesus, I don't know, where was your... Where was your faith? You know, you you shut down the churches. Some still haven't opened. How is it 
that you have no faith. Some of us have traded in the B-I-B-L-E, the Bible, for the CDC. We've traded in Christ for Fauci. Whatever Messiah Fauci says, that's the new law. And we've heard preachers preach something that I've never heard scientists preach in the reverse order. Preachers are preaching trust the science, but scientists never preach trust the preacher. Preachers are preaching what psychologists say, but psychologists never preach uh, trust the preacher. They don't even qu quote the preacher. As a matter of fact, to most secular psychiatrists, preachers are considered the enemy. You know why? Because we counsel for free. You said that three hours, you still talking. You go see a psychiatrist, uh, psychiatrist or psychologist. You, you can sit there and talk three hours if you want to. Oh, yeah. <laughs> when, when you're finished, you just bought a house. <laughs> Amen. Because you're going to pay for that time. Amen. You're going to go in there and you're going to be dead on point and, and get in and get out as fast as you can. Because once that hour is up, you can be mid sentence. Mid sentence. I mean, you, you're finally getting through. Time. You got to go home, hold it, let it keep till next week. That's the way that works. Say amen. So uh, Jesus rebuked them. And, 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 and I, I believe that he's saying to the body of Christ now, where's your faith? Where's your faith? Where's your faith? Where's your faith? And the Bible says, and they feared exceedingly and said one to another, what manner of man is this? I won't preach to you very long. What manner of man is this that even the wind and the sea obey him? Oddly enough, a demon is going to answer that question. That wasn't a rhetorical question. They just couldn't answer it. But a demon is going to give the answer. So in our text, chapter 5, we see Jesus arriving. They sailed across uh, the sea. And they came into Gentile territory. I showed you. They're in the land. And after they got off the ship, they took this walk to the land of the Gadareans. And the Bible says, and when he was come out of the ship, immediately there met him out of the tombs. Would you show him the tombs, please? Out of the tombs. Look at the, look at the tombs. Look at the tombs up there. All those openings, dead bodies are in there. Look at the terrain. It wasn't pretty and grassy. This, this wasn't those little paved sidewalks and all this. Out of the tombs, thank you so much, uh, came a man with an unclean spirit. And this man, like nature, was out of control. He came with an unclean spirit. Did I mention that he came from the tombs? All right, and the Bible says, who had his dwelling, here it is again, among the tombs. Mark wants us to know that this man lived amongst the tombs. For Mark is going to continuously uh, mention, he's going to mention even again, that this man had his dwelling place amongst the dead. That is, he was an, out, he was an outcast. He didn't fit didn't fit in with human beings, regular folk. He hung out with corpse, dead people. Who in their right minds hang out in the tombs? The Bible says in verse 4, verse uh, 3, uh, who had his dwelling among the tombs, and no man, Mark tells us something else about him, could bind him. He was fierce. 
This man had supernatural strength. For no one could bind him. Notice what he says. No, not with chains. Chains could not control this man who had his dwelling amongst the tombs. Now Luke gives us uh, even more information about this man. Luke tells us in Luke chapter number uh, 8 and uh, verse 27, it says, And when he, speaking of Jesus, went forth to land, there met him out of the city, the city of Gadara, a certain man, look at what, what, what Luke tells us, which had devils long time. So these demons had been in him for a long time. Now those of us who cast devils out know that this means this demon, uh, when, when a, de a devil has been in someone for a long time, the longer the devil is there, the harder it is to cast the devil out. That's why when you're in a service and where exorcisms are being, uh, uh, with, uh, where exorcism takes place, you need to pay attention and be praying and asking God to keep you. And this is why as Christians, we don't fool with Ouija boards. That's why you ought to stay away from certain vows. Praise the Lord. Don't hang around certain people. Leave Sister Mary alone. Never go and visit uh, Sister Mary Palm reading. Never go and visit the root workers. Don't turn to that kind of thing. Don't you? Because see, you're messing with spirits. And, and, you, and you're dilly-dallying with something that is much more powerful than you are. I heard someone say to me one time, well, I don't believe in that kind of stuff. Who cares? Demons don't need you to have faith in them for them to mess up your life. Matter of fact, they would much rather you not believe. The greatest lie that Satan ever pulled off wasn't him trying to get people to believe that there's no God. Satan's biggest lie was to get people to believe that he wasn't real. Because the moment you fail to believe that the devil is not real, you open yourself up to the devil. The moment you make a silly statement like, I don't believe in hell, I don't believe there's a real devil, I don't believe there's a literal devil. Well, when you say those things, you're also saying, I don't believe the Bible. Because we learn about the devil, we learn about Satan in the Bible. We learn about hell in the Bible. You can't believe portions of the Bible and not believe the whole Bible. Satan gets happy when you say, I don't believe in him. And, uh, and when he finishes with you, you will. Praise the Lord. So uh, Luke tells us, number one, that he had been in that situation a long time. Luke also tells us, and that he wore no clothes. So this man who went to meet Jesus who had his dwellings amongst the tombs. Demons had been in him for a long time and he was naked. And look at this back in chapter five of Mark verse four. And he had broken chains. No man could bind him. Now his skin wasn't tough like the Incredible Hulk. So you can imagine the, the, the marks and things that was on his body from breaking chains. It is, it is doubtful that he was hygienic. You saw, you saw where he was hanging out at. His dwelling place was the tombs. And the Bible says, because he had been often bound with fetters and chains, there's his hands and his ankles, and he plucked them asunder. Look at this, uh, in pieces, neither could any man tame him. By the time this man met Jesus, with, the, with the, the length of time that demons had been in him, this man was literally more monster than man. And then we're told something else about this man. The Bible says in verse five, and always night and day, he was in the mountains. And in the tombs, it mentions it again, in the tombs, crying and cutting himself. So, it is not likely 
that he carried a first aid kit. It's not likely that he had gauze to cover his wounds. It's very unlikely that anybody sold them up. So now visualize him. He has gaping wounds. He's fierce. Can't nobody reason with him. He possesses supernatural strength. He's naked. He's indecent. He's, he's horrible. He's, his dried up blood is all over him. From when he cut himself and bleed, there was nobody there to render first aid. He was in a horrible condition. Oh my, this man, He's called in theological circles the maniac of Gadara. And the people of Gadara, they stayed away from him. They said, look, don't, you, don't go to the tombs at night. You might get caught. Don't, don't, don't hang around this place because you can't beat him. You can't outrun him. And he won't, he won't show you any mercy. And yet this man came to meet Jesus. Uh, you know, one of the wonderful things about Jesus Christ is that Jesus Christ brings out the best and the worst in men. Amen. This, this man's mind was so uh, tortured that he worshiped, you're going to see, while cursing. And he confessed while blaspheming. That's what, that's what Jesus will do to you. See, Jesus will make you fighting mad and shouting glad. Most of us didn't get saved until the gospel offended us. You thought you were all there and the preacher preached a message and jab slapped you. And you were, you, were, you were insulted by that backhand that you got. And you went home and said, I ain't never going back to that church. But that word worked on you. Oh my, how No, he didn't say that. Who do he think he is? I ain't never going back to that church. Yeah, that's, what, that's when you don't heard a good sermon. Because you sitting there with the devil in you, you don't need to leave talking about, I enjoyed myself. And you need to leave convicted. Somebody said one time that people go to church to be made to feel better. I said they may, but I think good churches, people are made to feel how they should feel. If you got the devil in you, you ought not to be made to feel better. You ought to be convicted. So that you'll come out of your sin and give your heart to Jesus and, and get free. Praise the Lord. One of the worst, one of the worst compliments I ever got. I'd preached somewhere years ago. Man came up to me smelling like a pack of pal males. And said to me, Reverend, we're not, he need he needed to quit smoking. I ain't charge you. I said, oh God. I didn't preach good this day. I would have felt better had he said, man, I'll never hear you preach again. At least I would have known that the word of God got to him. Look at what happens. The Bible says, but when he saw Jesus, no matter how bad off he was, when he saw Jesus afar off, he ran and worshiped him. Now Luke chapter 8 and verse 28 helps us out with the word worship. It doesn't mean that he worshiped Jesus the way we do. It doesn't mean that he, he ran up to Jesus and said, Jesus, I love you. Jesus, you're my son in the morning. Jesus, you're the moon at night. Jesus, you're Lord. Jesus, no. He walked up to him. When, when, when Mark wrote worship, Luke shows us that Mark was referencing his physical posture. Verse 28 says, and when he saw Jesus, he cried out, and fell down before him with a loud voice. Worship fell down. The, the guy ran up to Jesus and did one of these numbers. He, he bowed to him, but not in reverence, but in homage. Now, what actually came out of his mouth, the text tells us. He said, and he cried with a loud voice and said, what have I to do with thee? That is, Jesus, what do we have in common? Yet the man ran to him, the best and the worst. 
ran to Jesus and said, what do we have in common? Then he did something that's, that's powerful in uh, demonic warfare. He does something. He refers to Jesus by his personal name and by his title. He calls him Jesus, thou son of the most high God. He said, I adjure thee by God that thou torment me not. In other words, he says, Jesus, make an oath to God. Make an oath to God the Father that you will not torment us. We have nothing in common, but I do recognize that you have power to torment us. But he did something that people who aren't skilled in demonic warfare might not recognize. In demonic warfare, you gain the upper hand if you can call the name of that demon. And the demon understood this, so you know what he did? He called the name of Jesus. Not because he loved the name, but trying to manipulate Jesus and to get control of the situation. So he called him Jesus, thou son of, do you see that? The most high God. You are watching warfare at its best. Now, temperature controllers, the saints are beginning to fan. So maybe I shouldn't have said anything in the first place. Amen. And so y'all do what you need to do. Praise God. I'm almost through preaching, but I like preaching, teaching. And we're in the Bible. Somebody posted the other day, and they thanked me for sticking with the Bible. I was glad to hear that. I'm glad that there are people who still love the Bible. Aren't you glad that you, there are people who still love the Bible? I think the Bible is more interesting than me. I'm not going to sit here and preach about me and Pam all day. What, I mean, what you going to get out of that? And, and preach various scenarios in our marriage. And so the whole sermon began began to degenerate to just being conversations on what happened in our household. Oh, no, that's not the word of God. It's not the Bible. I mean, I, I talk about some things, but I just think God's story is much more interested, interesting than mine. And I find it to be more interesting than yours. Amen. Demon tried to pull this trick on Jesus in Mark uh, chapter number one. Mark 1 and 21 said, and they went, into Capernaum, in, 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 in Hebrew, Jew, Jewish territory. And straightway on the Sabbath day, as he entered into the synagogue and taught, and they were astonished at his doctrine, for he taught them as one that had authority and not as the scribes. See, Jesus' authority came from a different, uh, he had a different kind of authority because Jesus' authority came from himself. And there was in their synagogue a man with an unclean spirit, and he cried out. The man interrupted Jesus' sermon. As Jesus was preaching, this man with the devil in him cried out, saying, Let us alone. What have we to do with thee? Notice what he said. Thou Jesus of Nazareth, art thou come to, de to destroy us? I know thee who thou art, the Holy One of God. This was to gain control. This was to let Jesus know that he knew who Jesus was. And notice what Jesus did. Jesus didn't even play the game. Jesus just looked at him and rebuked him and said, shut up. Looked at him and rebuked him and said, hold thy peace. Not only hold your peace, but come out of him. Because I don't care what the rules are. I'm stronger than you are. Saints, always remember that the greater one is with us. This is why I want believers to be bold. This is why I want believers to be brash. That's why I want believers to stop acting so scary, so hurt, so broken, and so dejected. Greater is he that is in us than he that is in the world. We have the stronger one abiding in us. You don't have to fear. You don't have to fear death. You don't have to fear sickness. You don't have to fear disease. You don't have to fear COVID. You don't have to fear anything. Trust God. 
We're going to be wise. We're going to take care of ourselves. I'll take care of myself. I went to the doctor. I had my, had my annual checkup and follow-up. Blood pressure, normal. Praise the Lord. Everything's in order. Resting heartbeat is real soft. Praise the Lord. About 62 beats a minute. That's good. And I'm not on any high blood pressure medicine or nothing. Doing this job. Almost 60. Almost 60. Uh, a black man under pressure. And in one of the highest pressure jobs known, leading us to higher heights and deeper depths. But God knows how to keep you calm. God knows how to heal your body. Say amen, somebody. God knows how to touch you. Yes, he does. That demon, that demon tried to pull that switcheroo on Jesus. Jesus said, come out of him. Shut up and come out. And that devil came out. So now we find the, the, the struggle is going on now in Gadara between Jesus and uh, this demon. And uh, look at what happened back in uh, Mark chapter 5. Now, y'all praying for me? Y'all still with me? Let me hear you say amen. All right, look at this. The, the plane is about to land or take off. Depends on how you see it. But Jesus, the, the man says to Jesus, we know who you are, Jesus, thou son of the most high God. I adjure thee by God that you torment me not. Now, why did that demon say that? The demon said it because Jesus initiated the conversation. For Jesus, for he said unto him, Jesus had already said to him, come out of the man. Thou unclean spirit. And when Jesus said, come out, that demon said, I know your name. I know who you are. You're Jesus. You're the son of God trying to get power. Jesus said, come out. And then Jesus, Jesus reversed it and said to him, all right, what's your name? And here's what Jesus knew. Jesus knew that that demon wasn't about to say to him, I'm not going to tell you. Because the superior one was standing there. See, when Jesus asks you your name, you're going to tell him your name. See, well, he's got the power. I said he's got the power. Our God can do anything. Somebody's faith is growing. Because you don't hardly hear faith preaching like this no more. Well, what we hear now, well, you got to have some sense. I thought having faith was having some sense. That's what they used to teach me. Faith is not reckless, but I tell you, it's not reckless to trust God. Praise the Lord. So now look at this. Jesus said, what is your name? And notice this. He answered, as one man answered, one demon. He answered and said, my name is Legion. For we are many. What is that? 60,000? 60,000. A legion, a Roman legion with 60,000 soldiers. That many spirits. Man said, my name is Legion. He had to say it because Jesus asked him, what is, it, what is your name? And he said, for we are many. Do you see that? And he besought him. That is, uh, Legion began to beg Jesus that he not send them away out of the country. You remember I told you he'd been there for a long time. Uh, Gadara was his territory. Demons are territorial. I've, I read where some theologians don't believe that, but if, if you're spiritual, you know they are. You can drive from one side of town to the next and sense the change in the atmosphere. You can sense, you know when you're in a, a dangerous area. You can feel the evil spirits. You can feel a vi the, the, the evil spirits from a violent side of town. You can tell when you're in a uh, side of town where they're selling sex. You can tell when you're in a side of town where the drugs are, are raging. And uh, uh, oh my, spirits, they're territorial. That's why certain areas are known for certain things. Demons have been assigned there trying to carve up God's world. But I'm glad today that I know that the earth is the Lord's and the fullness thereof. And so I heard him say, Lord, please, Jesus. Oh, my. Yeah, I know you had that man crying and cutting himself. But now you, you crying. 
See, the demons had the man crying, but now the demons are crying. Because Jesus then showed up. See, when Jesus shows up, everything changes. That's why you ought to pray in your home. Praise him when we come to church. Ask God to make sure you Lord, we want your spirit in here because we know if you show up, some good things are going to happen. And so now here we are, and they're begging Jesus not to send them out of the country. And look at Mark. I love his writing style. Mark with the with the the style of a Hollywood director. In verse 11, he shifts the scene. The scene goes away from Jesus. It goes away from the maniac of Gadara. It goes away from Legion. And the scene shifts to the side of an unnamed mountain. And our, uh, over there were some swines feeding on the mountain. So now all of a sudden we move from that conversation to a bunch of pigs eating on the mountainside. The swines and their herdmen. And their herdsmen and these swines were unclean animals. But after all, we were in Gentile territory. And they were there because Jesus said, let us pass over to the other side. Oh, Lord, so now we see the swines. And then, then Mark shifts the scene again. And he goes back to the devils. And he shows us something. When Jesus asked the man, what is your name? The man spoke and said, my name in the singular is Legion. And then he spoke for the rest of them, the 60,000. He said, for we are many. And verse 10 said, and he besought him much that he would not send him out of the country. But after they showed the swines and they saw that Jesus was getting ready to do something, the devils, they lost their rank. Legion was in charge. He was the one who spoke for everybody. But when they saw how much trouble they was in, all of them began to cry out. Verse 12 says, all the devils besought him saying, send us into the swines that we may enter into them. Notice this, notice this, notice this. Notice what they didn't say. Notice the argument they abandoned. They knew that they didn't have a snowball's chance in Hades of staying in that man. They knew that that fight was over. They didn't even ask to leave us here because they knew that Jesus came to town to deliver. When Jesus comes to town, he comes to change everything. Oh, Lord, they knew that we, we won't spend another hour in this man. So they said, we'll take the next best thing. We'll leave him and we'll go and get in those pigs. But whatever you do, Jesus, don't send us away. As a matter of fact, they didn't want Jesus to send them to hell because the Bible said in Luke chapter 8 and verse 31, and they besought him that he would not, that they besought him that he would not command them to go into the deep. The word deep comes from a Greek word that means the abyss. The abyss literally means the bottomless pit. They knew that Jesus had power to send them to hell right then and there. And they said to him, would you please let us go and get into the swines? And Jesus said, go ahead. The Bible said, he said in verse 13, and uh, forthwith, Jesus gave them leave. He didn't send them, but he let them go. And you talking about boogity, 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 boogity. Them demons went to running and the unclean spirits went out of the man and entered into the swines. And when they got into the swines, the swines lost their minds and ran down a steep hill. Oh, Lord. 2,000 of them and they choked in the sea. 
Isn't it amazing that as soon as they were in the swine, the swines died, but they were in that man for a long time, but God wouldn't let them kill him. Thank you, Lord, that you didn't let the devil kill me. Thank you, Lord, when I wasn't serving you, when I wasn't doing right, you still watched over me. Do I have anybody in here who can thank the Lord for not letting the devil kill you when you were out of the ark of safety, when you wasn't doing what God said do? The devil wanted to destroy you, but I heard the Lord say, don't you touch him. Don't you touch her. Don't you touch them because they belong to me. Somebody tell God thank you. Tell God thank you. Ah, thank you. Didn't let the devil kill me. Didn't let him crush me. But when he got in the swines, you see Jesus, his priorities are a little different than ours. Jesus felt that one human being was more valuable than 2,000 pigs. And when the swines ran down the hill and they, and they got drowned, the demons were in a bad place. No, the demons didn't drown. But they got something that was worse than that. The Bible says when the devil is cast out of a man, he go through dry places. Demons hate being disembodied. Jesus beat them at their own game. Can I get a witness? And they that were feeding the swine, they ran into the city of Gadara and they told the country and they said and then when they told them what happened they went out to see what was done the people from the country of the Gadareans they went out to see the spectacle they went out because they heard that that man that no one could control that, he, that Jesus had gained control of him, that the Lord had laid his hands on him. You know how it was. Many of you, when you first got saved, didn't nobody believe that you'd really been born again because they knew how you were before you got saved and they wouldn't believe it till they saw it for themselves and they went out there and they found that man they found that man and they found him sitting. This was the first time in a long time that he was sitting because before he was running from tomb to tomb, mountain to mountain, frightening the countryside, fear with rage, out of control. But when he met Jesus, Jesus brought calm to him. How many can say that since Jesus stepped into my life, he changed me. Things that I used to do, I don't do them no more. And things that I wouldn't do, I'm able to do them now because I've been born again. I've been touched by the Lord. Say yeah. Oh, Lord, if somebody give God praise for the man being able to just sit there. The rage was gone. The anger was gone. The frustration was gone. The chaos was gone. The craziness was gone. And he was sitting there. And the next thing that got them, now I don't know where he got it from. I don't know whether he went to Belks, Pennies, Lyle, Target, wherever. But the man was sitting there, clothed. Maybe one of the disciples said, I have an outfit. But he was sitting there clothed. Because when you get saved, you want to be decent. When you get saved, you want to you not show what you shouldn't show. Hallelujah. He's sitting there, clothed. Now, what is that saying? That's saying that a change 
really took place because to be clothed you got to participate you got to let them put clothes on you where the text tells us that no man could tame him no man could hold him no man could bind him but I'll tell you today that what's too big for men is just right for God thank you Jesus aren't you glad that Jesus arrested you when you were out when you were bound when the devil had you aren't you glad that the Lord came in and set you free say say He was clothed, sitting, clothed, and in his right mind. He wasn't cutting himself. He wasn't out of his head. He wasn't crazy. What was it? He was free. He was free. Jesus set him free. He was independent of the devil. That night was his Independence Day, and I wonder how many in here can say that the Lord have set me free. Think about what you've been freed from. Think about what he brought you out of. Think about the yokes he destroyed. Think about who you were. Think about who you are, and give God praise for setting you free. You put the cigarettes down. You put the liquor down. You put the midnight rambling down. You put fear down. You put depression down. You put it down. You put it down because Jesus, he set you free. You're not gonna kill yourself. You're not gonna lose. You're gonna have joy because Jesus set you free. We're all exes. We're all exes. For I heard Paul say, and such were some of you. But now you are washed, you are cleansed, you are justified in the name of the Lord. Hallelujah. I'm free. I'm free. change holding me hallelujah if you're free praise the Lord for your independence you ought to wave at somebody and tell them I'm free Ah, good God Almighty, some of y'all, you look like you're free, but some of you are trying to look like you're trying to decide whether you're free or not, but I'm here to tell you, to whom the Son sets free, he's free indeed, no more cutting myself, no more running around, no more hanging in the graveyard, the you've been free oh Lord you can say of a truth if I don't wake up in the morning yeah if I don't wake up in the morning you see I'm free if I don't wake up in the morning sit, let me sit intentional. I want to show y'all that I can sit down. Got clothes on. Covered. 
where I need to be covered. And uh, if you want to talk to me, we can have a good conversation now. Because Jesus touched my mind. Hallelujah. And look at the people. Look at what the people did. The Bible said when the people saw him, they were afraid. Not everybody's glad for you when Jesus touches you. Not everybody's glad. Oh, oh, when we went to two services, not everybody was glad. So oh, just wait, just wait, just wait. You're gonna get them now. You're gonna get them now. It's gonna be a big breakout. Just wait. Not everybody's glad. And then when it didn't happen, they tried to manufacture one. Not everybody's glad when God brings you out. When the Lord sets you free. Not everybody looked at you and see you freeing Jesus and some more some old half say thing will walk up to you. Now don't get don't get my soul uh, deep into that Jesus stuff. Let me tell you something. You get as deep in Jesus as you can. You go as far in Jesus as you can go. Don't you be ashamed of Jesus. Praise the Lord. Grab hold of Jesus. He'll set you free. Won't he do it? Oh no, you know what that problem was? You know what that problem was? Money. Now, he pigs, there were 2,000 of them. That's a whole lot of money. That's a whole lot of money. 2,000 pigs. That's a whole lot of money. Why not? You know what? Seemed to me somebody would have thought this to just ask this, you know, you know, man, you know, if he could cast the devil out of this guy like that, hey, man, you know, maybe we could ask him to raise the pigs. <laughs> hey, you know, praise God. If he could do, I mean, because this guy was messed up. Cause by comparison, it would be a small thing because the pigs wouldn't bother nobody. But nobody afraid of them. But instead, no. He said to Jesus, leave. And let me tell you something about Jesus. And you better hear me. Jesus doesn't stay where he's not wanted. Now I'm going to tell you something. You, you up in here, you don't know whether you want to be saved or not. You don't, wanna, don't know whether you want to serve the Lord or not. You're not going to make it. Jesus doesn't stay where he's not wanted. I'm telling you. Oh my, I hate to be the one. I really don't. But I got this. somebody got to tell you. The key to staying with Jesus is you got to want Jesus. Jesus has to feel wanted or he goes to where he is wanted. Well, you know, I don't know. I don't know. I'm not, I'm not sure whether I want to stay saved or not. I'm, by a matter of fact, I'm going to show you where the word prayer, pray and prayer is used but in two totally different ways. Both groups, the townspeople and the man that Jesus delivered were praying people. But they prayed from two different angles. The Bible says in verse 17, and they began to pray him, pray him to depart from their coast. When the people saw the swine, and they saw the things that was done. And when they saw the man that was possessed with the devils, and notice how Mark writes it in verse 16, and a last clause, and also concerning the swine, they began to pray him to depart from their coast. One thing about it, if you want Jesus to leave you alone, you don't have to pray hard. You don't have to pray hard. He's not going to fight you to be in you. He died for you. You know, talk, when the Lord gets ready, so and so gets saved. Jesus died on the cross for us to be saved. Rose again the third day, went to heaven and sent the Holy Ghost. Now and raised up preachers and, and set up the whole religious system and the gospel is everywhere. Now what else does he have to do to get you saved? You mean to tell me after all of that, well, he gonna have to show me something. No, he ain't gonna show you anything. You going to hell? That will show you. You hear me? Facebook Live, YouTube Live, not many preachers will tell you, just like I'm telling you. But I'm telling you. The 
Bible said he led captivity captive and he gave gifts to me. He left the apostleship, prophets, evangelists, teachers, pastors, all that. All that he left here. Now, you got, you're sitting there saying, well, that don't move me. I'm not impressed. Okay. You will be. You will be. And for everyone who responds to God, Christ's love like that, there's somebody else that's saying, Lord, have mercy on me, a sinner. Thank you, Lord. Oh, God, you mean to tell me that God gave his son and his son came to die for me as filthy as I am and Jesus took my place because he loved me and he wants to fill me with the Holy Spirit and he wants to give my life joy and give my life meaning and when I die, take me to heaven to be with him forever. Where do I sign? What, where, where the dotted line? Where, how do, that, that did happen in our eight o'clock service. We, a woman got saved during the communion. See, a lot of visitors, a lot of visitors, that's why you have to be careful when you ask, are there no visitors? Visitors come all the time. But a lot of them not come at 8 o'clock. A visitor came and got saved this morning. We were passing out the communion. I had, I had opened the altar. And she, am I right? Walked right down here. And, and uh, she was ready to be saved too. And, and she wasn't one of those that had been saved five times before. Some people are professional get savers. Yeah, she was ready to be saved. And the Lord saved her. You won't like me, but some of us are asking too much of the Lord. He's done it already. So they, I'm, I'm finished. They, they prayed him leave. You know what Jesus did? He didn't argue. Verse 18, and when he was come into the ship, they prayed, leave, he got in the ship. He walked away. He walked down that hill, walked down that mountainous terrain. Can you see him? He's still, it's all still the same long day. It's late at night now. Ain't no sun come up. There's no scripture that says on tomorrow. This is still a continuation. He don't even get a chance. They won't let him sleep there all night. He's got to sail back across and get to Galilee. He walks down the mountainous terrain because they begged him. They prayed that he would leave. And then another prayer was prayed. Verse 18, the second clause says, after Jesus was on the ship, he that had been possessed with the devil prayed. Prayed him that he might be with him. He prayed also. But his prayer was, Jesus, let me be with you. That's my prayer. Now, if a person just don't want Jesus, you just don't want, you just don't, I'm asking Jesus, give me, Lord, if you can do it. I don't know how, if it works that way, but if they give you up, that part of you that they've given up, give it to me, Lord. I'll take it. I'll take it. I want Jesus. I want Jesus. I want to be saved. I want to go to heaven. I want Jesus. I'm saved. I'm in the church. I'm in, I'm in this. I want Jesus. I praise the Lord. I mean, I'm not in no valid decision. This is, this, is, this is it for me. I'm growing. Asking the Lord to make me strong every day. Not perfect. I don't have a halo over my head. Not sprouting any wings. But I love Jesus. And I'm in this. I want this. I'm not wondering. I'm not doubting about the way. I'm not wondering if the Muslims are right. I'm not, I'm not wondering whether or not the Buddhists have it. Praise the Lord. Mm -mm. Till I die. Till I die. He saved me one Sunday morning in 1977. Here we are in 2021. He's a keeper. He's a and I'm, 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 I'm convinced this man said, please, I pray you, let me go with you. After all them people prayed that Jesus would leave. I can see it. And every time I read this, I get a little emotional. It, it moves me. Our Lord is on the ship. 
just about to set sail. Hey! Whoa, before you leave. Jesus, Jesus, please. Don't leave me here with these people. They weren't moved by my deliverance. They didn't care. Had they been moved my, by my deliverance, they would, they would have never asked you to leave. Let me come with you. Let me go. Let me follow you. Let me sail away with Jesus. Let me own the ship. And uh, there's only one time in Scripture where Jesus told a man, no, you can't follow me this time. Said to him, no, but you go home. I know you hadn't been there in a long time because you've been hanging around the tombs, but you ain't going to be around the tombs no more. You go home. Go home to thy friends. They're going to be surprised to see you. You're talking about the impact the guy had by the gate called Beautiful. And he walked in and people were going, that looked like him. But the man walked in, walking, leaping and praising God. Jesus said, you, man, you, they ain't going to believe it. You're going to walk home in your right mind with clothes on, <laughs> under control. Go, go let your friends see what I've done for you. And tell them, show and tell, let them see and tell them how great things the Lord have done for thee and have had compassion on thee. And you know what that man did? He departed. He turned and walked away. Jesus sailed away. He walks through the crowd of these wicked Gadareans. So y'all, excuse me. He says, I got, I got an assignment. I got to go to the, to the Decapolis. There, there are 10 cities that are spread out, spread out throughout Syria, Jordan, and Palestine. Gentile cities. I got to go, excuse me, and tell them that there's a man named Jesus who will set your soul free. And uh, he did it. And you know who got left out? The people of Gadara. The ones who told Jesus to leave. All Bible students know that he never went back to Gadara. He never went back. Don't tell him to leave. He may never come back. Some of you, you you've thrown opportunities away. You've, you've, chosen, you've chosen your signs. You chose the wrong group. What God wanted to do will never be done. Choose wisely. Choose wisely. I'm talking to you. Choose wisely. Choose life and live. Choose Christ. Bow your head. He wants to give you independence. Independence from depression. Independence from sin. Independence from fear. Independence from error. Independence. Independence from the enemy. To be free to be that person he would have you to be. When the man was crying, cutting himself, swollen, smelly, naked, dried up blood everywhere, fierce, and all that. Every time Jesus looked at him, every time God the Father looked at him, you know what God the Father saw? He saw an evangelist. <laughs> he saw a preacher. He saw somebody, I'm going to polish up. I'm going to dress him up, and I'm going to save him. God Almighty. Father, here we are. Here we are. And we thank you today on this Independence Day. We thank you for our independence. You set us free from sin. You set us free from the devil. We're on our way to heaven. 
And God, we're enjoying the trip. Set us free, Lord. And we pray, oh God, for others, that you would free them in the name of Jesus. You went through the storm and the rain, through huge winds to get to this man, and you set him free. Oh God, use us as your instruments to get to people and to set them free in the name of Jesus to do it through your glory and through your honor, for your glory and for your honor. On this day that we observe the birth of our nation, we thank you and we think about the day that we were born again. Hallelujah. Born again. And being born again set us free. In Jesus' name, thank God. Amen. And amen. Would you worship the Lord right where you are?